How many of you uh, remember the movie Love Story? Okay, I see several hands. There's a couple youngsters uh, here that, <laughs> that I asked that question a few weeks ago and they hadn't heard of it, but I think they've looked it up online since then. So. But uh, that came out, I think, the summer I graduated from high school, around 1970 or so, and I tend to be pretty sentimental, and I went to see it two or three times. Maybe that sounds kind of girly, I don't know, but <laughs> again, it, it is what it is. Uh, but what I want to discuss today is the ultimate love story of all times. My purpose today is to discuss the awesome, perfect love of our father and elder brother, Jesus Christ. And then to consider how we need to be becoming like them, which, which has to do with this season of the year with Passover. And we're going we're gonna to read some of, the, some of the scriptures that are typically read uh, at Passover. We're going to read some of those and then see where we're supposed to be going from here. So let's turn to John chapter 10, verses 8 through 11. Or, I'm sorry, verses... John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. And by the way, I do have a prop today. Uh, I'll tell you what it is later. You're, look, you're looking at it right now, but I'll tell about my prop later. And I'll weave a couple personal stories in with the subject too and I know you all have stories too and you've probably probably mostly most all of you probably have similar stories but uh, anyway that'll that'll tie in with the prop later <clears throat> okay John John chapter 10 verses 11 through 18 we're, we're going to do quite a bit of reading here in in John here to begin with <clears throat> Christ says I am the good shepherd the good shepherd gives his life for the sheep but a higher a hireling who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees, and the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. The hireling flees because he is a hireling, does not care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd, and I know my sheep and, and am known by my, by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep." And other sheep I have, which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life, that I may take it again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of myself. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. This command I receive from my Father. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So that's the kind of Savior that we have. And let's, let's uh, read now in John chapter 13, verses, uh, we'll be reading between verses 1 and 17. John chapter 13, 1 through 17. I may skip down through here some, we'll see. It's about uh, Christ washing the disciples' feet and giving the example of how we're to serve, have humility and serve others. John chapter 13, starting verse 1. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come, that he should not depart, that he should depart from this world to the Father, having loved his own who were here in the world, he loved them to the end. And that's an important point right there. Christ didn't just love those then or us now, just kind of part way or kind of mostly, but he, lo he loved them and he loves us to the end. After supper being ended, the devil having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going to God, rose from supper and laid aside his garments, took a towel, and girded himself. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and wipe them with the towel with which he... He was girded. Then he came to Simon Peter, and Peter said to him, Lord, are you washing my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but you will know after this. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, If I do not wash your feet, you have no part with me. 
Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. To which Jesus replied, He who is bathed needs only to, to wash his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew who would betray him, therefore he said, You are not all clean. So when he had washed their feet, taken his garments, and sat down again, he said to them, Do you, do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you say, Well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. Most assuredly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is he who is sent greater than he who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. And, and to put this in context, and I, I know this was discussed here a few weeks ago, I think, I think by John Reedy, that, okay, this is Christ and, and, you know, the disciples, and they were together for a period of time, but this is also the creator of the old, the creator, God of the Old Testament who came to earth and was impregnated into Mary and was born as a baby. And he gave up all of that to do things like this, to, to come and wash feet and then to give his life for us. And then uh, in John 13, nearby in John 13, 34 and 35, a new, Christ says, A new commandment I give to you, that you love one another as I have loved you that you also love one another. And how did Christ love us? He gave his very life for us. He was, he, was, he, was, he was our sacrifice. By this, all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Okay, so this new commandment wasn't just a commandment, but it was also a sign to the world that we are gods because we have love for one another. So that's a pretty important thing. <clears throat> Moving on to the next thought, in John chapter 14, verses 17, or 15 through 17, let's read that. I, to me, this is a pretty in, incredible passage. In verse, John 14, verse 15, Christ says, If you love me, keep my commandments, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper. Or in, in the original, it's, the word is parakletos. And uh, anytime I think of that, I, I had really hoped to be here. It had been my intention to be here last Sabbath because I knew Lenny Cascio, is that the correct pronunciation, was going to be here. Uh, and I know he used to write a what he called the Sabbath morning companion. I think he still writes something. I'm not sure, but he would, he would uh, I'd get an email every Friday evening, I think it was. And one time, back a number of years ago, about eight years ago, it was about the Paracletos. It was about this scripture and Christ saying that the Father would send the Paracletos or the Helper. And and He described what that Paracletos meant, that and that the disciples would have understood it at that time. That a Paracletos was somebody to come alongside and help. For example, if there's a ship in distress and it, it needed to be helped into safe harbor, another ship, a Paracletos, would be sent to come to their aid to help them into safe harbor. So that's, that is at least a part of the meaning of this word Paracletos. And that, that's got, that, uh, to me that gives a pretty, pretty vivid memory, I mean meaning to it. Okay, so, and I will pray the Father and he will give you another helper paracletos and it may may abide with you forever in verse 17 the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor hears him but you will know him for he dwells with you and will be in you verse 23 jesus answered and said to him if anyone loves me he will keep my he will keep my words and my father will love him and will come to him and make our home with him well, how awesome is that you know, it, it reminds me of in this world, you know, people, a lot of people are awestruck by celebrities, which I'm, I'm not, I really don't get that. Uh, but in this world, it offers things like, if you're lucky and you go to some concert and 
if you're really lucky and you're the winner, you might get a backstage pass to go see this, this entertainer or, or a celebrity that's probably pretty shallow. I'm, you know, I'm not saying all celebrities are shallow. I don't know, and I maybe don't care a whole lot. Uh, but that's, that's what the world, the kind of thing the world offers. What God offers is the creator and sustainer of the whole universe and all of creation. We don't just get a backstage pass. They will dwell in us. They'll come and live with us. How awesome is that? So that's, you know, that's not just a maybe it'll happen. That's, that's a, a bona fide promise. And God can't break his promise. In uh, verse 25, uh, in uh, John 14, yeah, John 14, 25, continuing. These things I have spoken to you while being present with you. But the Helper, the Paracletos, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, it will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all things that I have said to you. Now, I'll, I'll tell about a personal story here that I always think of when I, when I, when I read this scripture. And, uh, and I know you all have your personal stories too. I don't, I don't know yours, so I'll tell the one, I'll tell one that I do know that that was uh, quite meaningful to my wife and I and our family. <clears throat> um, eight years ago, this past Valentine's Day, I had gone to Dallas. We were building our the United Church building, and I had ordered some specialty aluminum to use on the window towers, two-story window towers. And <clears throat> so I took a boat trailer over there. They were 20-some feet long, and to haul these, just I think about eight square, eight or ten square tubular aluminum pieces back <clears throat> and I got a call from Linda that our daughter had been been in a bad accident out of state a couple days drive away and all I knew at that point was and I was in Irving near the DFW airport all I knew all we knew at that point was the guy driving the other vehicle was dead and our daughter was headed to the hospital in the ambulance. And you talk about a long two-hour wait before we could find out anything. And, and I called friends of ours and got a hold of her and asked them to pray, pray for her, for our daughter. And uh, <clears throat> come to find out what happened was our daughter Tiffany was on a four-lane road just down, just not too far, just a few miles at most from their house she was she'd been left the office going to the gym and then was headed headed home she was, it was a four lane road she was on the far outside lane and another driver was coming southbound on the far outside lane so they were both on the far outside lanes well the next thing tiffany knew this guy hit her head on and he was speeding and come to find out he was highly intoxicated and it was a combined impact of 131 miles an hour. And it basically tore his car in half, killed him instantly. And, but for the grace of God, I don't have any other explanation why our daughter would have survived. She was driving her Acura SUV, which is, you know, it's pretty good size, not, not the biggest, but certainly not the smallest either. And it basically pushed, if this were her car, and this is the driver's side, it basically shoved the, the bumper up to the windshield. And <clears throat> so finally, uh, we, we found out a couple hours later, I didn't know whether to have Linda come to Dallas and fly out there, <clears throat> fly out there with me or to wait there or what. So, so we waited it out and uh, found out a couple hours later she was in the ER and uh, she was beat up really bad, but she wasn't she wasn't uh, wasn't injured really badly. She was really sore, and she was telling the people in the ER that that they were going snow on a snowboarding trip or a ski trip the next day to Colorado, and they were laughing it off. The doctors and nurses like, "No, you're not." <laughs> and uh, she was actually released from the hospital later that night, and so I called and talked to her, and she was still determined to go on the to go on the ski trip. 
uh, and I tried my best to talk her out of it. They ended up going, uh, and she was really sore, and the plane ride was really rough on her. Uh, but it ended up being the best thing she could do because at that point she was going through survivor's guilt because the other guy died. There was in no way was it her fault. She was doing the speed limit. She was, she was in her lane. Uh, but being there with her husband and friends, that helped her work through the survivor guilt part of it. But the main part of the story that I wanted to tell was when the accident happened, she had no idea what happened. She excuse me, she was sitting there screaming uh, and <clears throat> she looked up and, and there was, as she described him, a, a distinguished looking gentleman standing there at her window and, <clears throat> come to, and him and his son. And he had been, they had been following right behind Tiffany and, <clears throat> and he was a physician, a doctor. And so he got, Tif <clears throat> he got Tiffany calmed down and uh, then when he stepped away from, from Tiffany's vehicle to uh, call the emergency personnel, the ambulance and police, his son came up there, who was about Tiffany's age, and talked to her and, you know, tried to calm her down, which I've always thought that was amazing. And I've, I've always wished I knew who, who these two people were because I'd like to call them up and go meet them, thank them, take them to dinner or something. But, but then I've also always wondered, you know, the scenario, I've always wondered, were these angels? I don't know. And, and it, really does, it really doesn't matter because that's part of the whole point is we know that God can perform miracles. He's, he's always performed miracles. And it may be more, more awesome to God when he sees us, his creation, actually become like him where where we care about our fellow man and we we serve others and do the kind of thing that god would do i, I can't help but believe that that's pretty miraculous to god a long story short she was uh tiffany was she was really sore for a while her sternum was really sore uh but then you know she didn't have any major injuries and she was just fine after that uh, it did apparently lead to her having a tumor on her leg where her leg hit the dash several years ago and we had, I know you had several prayer requests for, for her here about three and a half years ago which, which we hugely appreciated and God healed her of that and she's doing great. She ran, ran the half marathon, I think it was not this January but last January. So it's our job, knowing, knowing how Christ was, and He came to be our Savior, and He was, he was a living, he, he was a sacrifice, He sacrificed his, his life for us. It's our jobs to be living sacrifices for others, to be like Christ was. God loves to swoop down and show himself strong on our behalf, just like he says in 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9. 2 Chronicles 16, verse 9, where, <clears throat> where he says, For the eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong on behalf of those whose heart is loyal to him. And the word, the word loyal, you know, I like that verse, but the word loyal, well... Actually, that, that's, in, that's in the uh, New King James. I like the way the New King James words it. In the King James, it always bothered me a bit because in the King James, it says, shows himself strong on the behalf of those who have a perfect heart, I believe it is. That kind of bothered me because, you know, I kind of know my heart and it ain't always perfect. And so I'm thinking, I don't know if that's going to work in my favor or not. Okay, but in the New King James, and I've, I've looked this up a little bit, but what the meaning is, is in Strong's Concordance, it's uh, number 8003. And the two meanings that Strong's Concordance uses is for loyal or perfect is friendly towards God or peaceable towards God. I think that hopefully gives me a chance. 
because that's what we all should be is we should be loyal to God and we should be friendly towards God and we should be peaceable toward God, not fighting with him because, because in that scripture does not apply to us. There's, there's many, many examples in the Bible of, of uh, God intervening on our behalf. To, you know, I think of Elisha. You know, I, I just love opening up the Bible to, to Kings, and there's account after account after account of, in there of, of uh, Elisha and just different amazing miracles. And, and I'm totally convinced that if we had any idea, we, 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 I'm sure we all know different times in our lives when God has intervened for us, uh, but I bet we don't have a clue. It's he could intervene twice in the last two minutes, you know. For all I know, I don't know, but but I am quite convinced that I know he intervenes. He's intervened on my life in my life ever since I was born, and I'm also convinced that I don't even know the tip of the iceberg of when he's intervened. And in addition to sustaining us our lives all these all these years, <clears throat> I had another prop I thought about bringing, but but uh, I didn't because I didn't feel like I'd have time. I might bring it some other time, and you won't even if I, if I bring it, you'll you you won't even know what it is. But you'll think, why does that guy look so dorky, <laughs> or dorkier than normal? Okay, you know, there's times when God gives us, gives us what we want. And when we ask, you know, when we're asking for a miracle, whether it's health situations or whatever it is, and there's other times when he doesn't. And I don't have any ex- really any explanation for that other than that God is God and, and I'm not. And he knows, he knows the big plan and I don't. And it reminds me of when, when Lazarus died and Christ wept. But then he resurrected him. And <clears throat> every once in a while, one of my guys that work for me, they'll tell me, they'll come to me and they'll say, we got a big problem. And as soon as, soon as they say that, I'm thinking, no, we don't. Because any time, almost any time they, they think it's a big problem, I think, no, that's easy to fix. But, and I think there's an analogy here with our spiritual lives because and usually... Something that's a big problem, they think of as a little problem. And that kind of makes me crazy. <laughs> but, but usually when it's, they think it's a big problem, it's usually as an easy solution. Well, I think that applies to God because, you know, I totally understand when we have a loved one or, or ourselves, you know, have a, a serious illness or terminal illness or something really serious like that. To us, it's a big problem. But... To God, it's not. He, he gets the emotions of it, but that's an easy fix for him. I mean, he'll, he knows he'll, he'll raise them back up. And, prob- and to us, the little problems are probably the things where we know we've got certain character <coughs> issues that we need to work on, and we, we, we just kind of coast along, and, and uh, you know, that's not that big a problem. But it is, because those things that we think of as a little problem can, can keep us out of God's kingdom. But as far as giving life, you know, God gave life to begin with and, and he can give it again. So to God, that's a little problem. Not, not to take away from, from how difficult it can be on us humans, but uh, it kind of reminds me of that scenario. <clears throat> the prop I've got today is this silk rose. And somebody asked me, Bob asked me if I've been to a wedding recently. I... I have been to a few weddings, some recent, some not so recent, uh, which is where this came from. It's, uh, it's about 26 years old. It's getting rather tattered, but it's pretty special to me. <clears throat> I grew up in Indiana, and a lifelong friend of mine, Eddie, called. We, we would still, we moved to Longview when I was 16, but Eddie and I always stayed in close contact. We'd go to the feast together and things like that. And uh, he called, it was in between Christmas and New Year's of 1990. I, I had just been three years, or, yeah, three years earlier, I had been the best man at him and his wife's wedding. And he called and told us he was just diagnosed with cancer. And... <clears throat> 
that they said he had to have surgery immediately. It was lymphoma. And so when they put him on chemo, they did the surgery, put him on chemo. I flew up there and spent five days with him and his wife. They had a precious little year and a half old daughter, Corita. And uh, the chemo was just really rough on Eddie. He, was, he lost all of his hair. He got shingles. He vomited up chunks of his stomach. It was just terrible. <clears throat> Two weeks, and Paula, his wife, was pregnant with their second daughter at that time. And I came back home. Two weeks later, Eddie died. And <clears throat> I, I thought, I remember I'd come home from work and Linda came in there and told me that they called and said he died. And, <clears throat> and I, thought, I thought I was prepared for it. But then after about five minutes, it hit me and it just, just tore me up. And three months after that, Eddie's second daughter was born. Never met her dad. And I would, at that time, we were living north of Dallas in Hickory Creek, just north of Louisville. And we were doing uh, an apartment job over here in, in Longview. I was, we were rebuilding an eight-unit burnt apartment building. So I had a lot of windshield driving back and, back and forth from Dallas. And I'd be thinking about that, and it would just, I'd just start bawling for six months because it would just seem so sad and it seemed so unfair. You know, Eddie had only been married three years, had a little one and a half year old daughter. His second daughter wasn't even born yet. He dies, second daughter never, ever, never meets her dad. And it's one of those situations that just seems so unfair. But then on the other hand, like I mentioned a while ago, God gives life and he allows life to be taken and he's got the big plan and, and Eddie will live again. And this is the rose that they gave, gave me to wear in, in Eddie and Paula's wedding. And then I wore it three years later to his funeral. I've worn it a number of times. So, but during all, during all these years, Paula and the girls and, and I have stayed in close contact. And back here a few years ago, we got a, a graduation announcement from high school. It's like, wow, boy, that happened awful fast. You know, she was a one and a half year old, now she's graduated from college. And then, then not long, the other one's graduated from, from, I mean, graduated from high school. And then the other one, and then they're both in college. And then <clears throat> uh, Corita, the older one, gets married up in Ohio. Linda and I drove up there for her wedding. And uh, I wore this rose to her wedding. And... Uh, then eventually, Shauna got engaged and got married. We went up, went to Indiana last October for Shauna and Ike's wedding. And of course, I wore the rose. And I, I've always remarked to Paula that it, seems, it has seemed really clear to me that all these years, God has had a hedge around Paula and Corita and Shauna. And I was always a little bit intrigued that, I've, I've told Paula that numerous times, but I was always a little intrigued that Paula never really said much about that. And uh, <clears throat> this last summer, uh, I was a couple couple of days drive away from here, and we'll back up on the story a little bit. A year after Eddie died, I was in my office, and I had I had intended to call Paula about a year after Eddie died and tell her that, <clears throat> that I hope when the time is right that she's able to get on with her life. And I hadn't called her yet and about that time I was in the office and, and Paula called me and she wanted to tell me about this guy that she met. And, uh, and I, so I told her, well I actually have been planning on calling you and telling you that I hope you could get on with your life when, you know, whenever it's the right time for you. And uh, she was just really excited and <laughs> we talked for quite a while and we said goodbye and hung up and then about a minute later my phone rings again it's Paula again she's so excited she wants to talk more so <clears throat> so we talked some more and her and John got married I think it was uh, within a year from then roughly I think and he is just such an awesome guy we stayed at their house uh, when we went up for Shauna's wedding in October and Back to the story where I was a while ago, they came to see me. Uh, I was gone from the area here for six weeks last, this time last year. And uh, they went on a month-long camping trip, and 
And they've got three adopted sons that they, they've adopted since then. They were like ages one, two, and four, I think. Uh, which is, that tells you a lot about them because they're, they're really kind, giving people. And anyway, Paula made the comment one day on, this, on their visit last year. She said, <clears throat> you know, you've told me several times that, that uh, <clears throat> God has had a hedge around Krita and Shauna and I. And I said, yes. And she said, well, <clears throat> I wanted to tell you that every day before Eddie died, he would pray for the three of us. He would pray for Paula and Karita and Shauna. <clears throat> and she said, God never forgets a prayer. And I never thought of it like that. But that's true. And she said, God has honored every one of Eddie's prayers. And, <clears throat> and I'm sure that John, I have no doubt at all that John is a big part of the answer to that prayer. He's just an incredible, awesome, loving guy. So, you know, and, and Paula and I have discussed it before, you know, she, you know the, the fact that we don't know why God allowed Eddie to die. And God knows. We don't know. You know, that certainly would not have been our pref preference. But on the other hand, Paula said that she's really grateful to have their third daughter, who is John, hers and John's daughter. And, uh, and they've got the three boys they adopted. But it, when we go through hard things like that in life, God has a plan and he makes it work out to his perfect will. Let's uh, turn to John chapter 17, verses 20 through 22. John 17, 20 through 22. <clears throat> Christ says, I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they, may, that they may be one as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me, and the glory which you gave me I have given them, that they may be one just as we are one. And you know, in I'm sure you're all familiar with Matthew 25 about the Christ judging the sheep from the goats. And that's something we always need to keep in mind, you know, where Christ says, you know, you, I was thirsty and you came to me and you gave me water and I was hungry and you fed me and I was in prison and you visited me, all of that. <clears throat> and then they said, well, Lord, when did we do those things to you? And his comment was, when you did it to the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. That's our job. And uh, I'll just refer to uh, a couple more scriptures here. Romans 12, one of my favorite chapters in the Bible, starts out, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your, your bodies a living sacrifice. That's our job, to be a living sacrifice. For the rest of our lives, today, tomorrow, the rest of our lives. Holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. Verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is the, that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. <clears throat> and then over to uh, Philippians chapter 2, which is another one of my favorite chapters. <clears throat> Philippians 2, I'll, I'll start in, in uh, verse 1. Therefore, and this is about the example that Christ set for us of how we're to live our lives and be like our older brother. <clears throat> Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. Verse 5. Let this mind be in you, which also was, was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, 
he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even on the death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name which is above every name. So let's become like our perfect, loving, heavenly Father and elder brother, Jesus Christ, that made the ultimate sacrifice for us. Let's resolve to become like them and reflect their love to others. As Philippians 2.5 says, Let this mind be in you, which also was in Christ Jesus. And at this time, my wife Linda and Wayne and Joanne Woodring will be coming up and they'll sing a song that ties in with this, with this subject. And uh, they, Wayne and Joanne just got back recently from a, they've both been on whirlwind trips. For, <laughs> they're probably pretty tired, but we really appreciate them coming and singing. My wife pointed out I forgot to tell the name of the song. She's right. It's The Promise written by Javine, Javine Hilton and Francis White. Is it on? Can you hear me? Test, test, test. I never said that I would give you silver or gold Or that you would never feel the fire or shiver in the cold But I did say you'd never walk through this world alone I did say, don't make this world your home. I didn't say that fear wouldn't find you in the night, or that loneliness was something you'd never have to fight. But I did say, I'd be right there by. intend to keep my grace will be sufficient in every time of need my love will be the anchor that you can hold on to this is the promise this is the promise I've made to you I never said that friends would never turn their
to you.